Alrighty, date is day. To be honest, this is one of those episodes that at first glance you look at this one and you're like, wow, this is insanely focused on data. How would you do this as a TTRPG? You're not going to have the players, you know, play data as you. Yeah, yeah. The core conceit of this one is that data is doing a special log so that he can give it to Commander Bruce Maddox because he wants information on how androids think and go about their daily lives. So Maddox asked Data to give him some logs of just what he does on a daily basis and record his thought processes about the things that he's doing and so on and so forth. Yeah, whatever. That's the reason why the episode is uh, told mostly from Data's perspective, and not the usual way that they would uh, frame episodes. Now, to be quite honest, I probably would skip that aspect of this if I was trying to do this in a TTRPG. Like, the, sp the specific point of view, I mean, each of the players is going to have be basically be doing that already so you and it's going to be different for each of the players from their perspective so it doesn't really work the same way however the big picture for this one is actually that it's a slice of life episode it spends almost the entire episode doing mundane things i'm not going to say boring things but mundane things like um, Miles O'Brien's wedding to Keiko. It is actually the first uh, episode that we see uh, Rosalind Chow as Keiko. And, you know, she's so someone who goes on to appear in a lot of episodes later. Now, that's an interesting uh, thing, though, because of the fact that um, from a TTRPG standpoint, this is kind of sort of like introducing a secondary character that isn't necessarily a GM-controlled character. This would kind of sort of be more like whoever plays Miles O'Brien now has a second or third or fourth character to also uh, play at. Which, hey, you know what? In some TTRPGs, that works great. Star Trek Adventures, yeah, you could probably pull that off. I'm pretty sure that would work fine. Again, it kind of depends on how the players are uh, um, trying to do it, but whatever. Anyway, so, so, a large part of the episode is taken up with Miles O'Brien and Keiko's wedding, as told from Data's perspective, since he's, well, helping to arrange the ceremony. Because this was done as like a, from an in-universe perspective, as like a really big deal ceremony, even though he's a relatively low-ranking um, okay. Because, you know, we have Captain Picard as uh, the officiator, and this is not the holodeck! Yeah, that's that's the other part about this that's interesting, is that, okay, Keiko, it, since she, she's not actually a Starfleet personnel, she's a civilian who works on the ship, who does stuff. So she actually has no reason to show up in a Starfleet uniform. And that's why she's wearing this elaborate dress. Miles, of course, does the uh, usual thing for a uh, professional military man and showing up in his uh, best uh, formal uniform. And because of the fact that it's actually Geordi that's Miles' best friend, Geordi is the uh, best man at the wedding. Data is somewhere helping with stuff. Somewhere. 
trying to remember which uh, d uh, deck this is. I don't think it was 10 forward, but whatever. Anyway, yeah, let's see. Let's go ahead. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to make this into a thumbnail later. Anyway, though, um, so this is kind of the B plot. This is one of those episodes where it really, really struggles. Or it's difficult for a person re reviewing it at, from a later perspective to um, annotate it as A plot and B plot because of the fact that it's a question of how you define A and B. It's like, which one takes up uh, more screen time? versus which one is, from an in-universe perspective, more important? Well, from a storytelling perspective, the one that's the most significant is actually the wedding thing, because of the fact that Keiko O'Brien goes on to be in a lot of episodes later. A lot. From the perspective of the TV producers, it's actually introducing a new character. and from a TTRPG standpoint, that would also be true, is that it's introducing a new character. Now, speaking of new characters, though, there's actually a lot of them in this episode. A lot. Many of them are minor characters that we literally never see again, but they are all characters that the people who introduced them could have reused if they had so chosen to. Other than Keiko, obviously, was intended to be a new main cast. The others were people that you could have reused if you'd wanted to, but were not meant to be seriously important. So, who are the others? Now, I mentioned something earlier about how there's a a distinction of which is the A plot and which is the B plot. Well, what's probably uh, most people would consider the B plot is the um, Ambassador Tapel story. She is being transferred for diplomatic reasons so that she can um, talk to a Romulan admiral, I think is what it said his name was. Yeah, Romulan admiral named Mindak for diplomatic negotiations on board Mindek's ship, the Divorce. And, um, yeah, see, turns out, however, that it's a trap. See, the Divorce does not actually uh, attempt to um, destroy the Enterprise, really. They did, however, object to the Enterprise's insistence that they, um, shall we say, recapture the um, diplomat who uh, decided she was leaving the Federation permanently. But, um, you know, they didn't really seriously want to destroy the Enterprise. They, they're just like, no, go away, or we will shoot you. Leave us alone. Anyway, though, um, now, that's where things get weird. See, because as it turns out, Tapel is really a Romulan by the name of Seelok, who was a deep cover operative. This is one of the things about this episode that gets a bit weird. It's like, why are the Romulans extracting? What are they trying to gain by extracting an, an intelligence asset that has been so deeply embedded in Federation politics that she managed to get, become an actual Im, a, ambassador uh, in the uh, Federation and be assigned to doing diplomatic relations with the Romulans? Like, couldn't she just? pass off whatever information she happened to steal? Why does she need to leave the Federation permanently? 
that is a question we never get answers for. Because after she uh, gets on board the divorce, uh, Tapel is like, ha ha, screw you, I'm not talking. Bye. Um, non canon sources uh, seem to uh, indicate that it was actually a physical theft that was involved with this. Although I still have to question uh, why she needs to disappear because if she's talking to Mendak on board the Devoris, she can just hand off whatever physical object she wants to give the Romulans that she stole from the Federation. <sighs> whatever. Tapel is um, seemingly a character that is actually well respected within the Federation. No one seems to treat her with suspicion. Until, of course, she fakes her own death. And at that point, it's too late for anyone to attempt to do anything about it. Like I said, which of these two stories is the A plot and which is the B plot is kind of weird to think about because they're completely different kinds of story. And the situation with Tapel uh, and M Mindek is something that could have been followed up by uh, writers in later episodes, although they didn't. Not directly, anyways. They did do other Romulan things, but didn't... I don't, I don't know if any... Okay, it was mentioned by Nora Saiti uh, in a later episode as something that Picard screwed up on. And as was pointed out in the drumhead, Picard screwing up in this way was something that he had no reason to question. He had no information to indicate that Ambassador Tapel was a spy. Nothing. And then, poof, gone. Ah, uh, too late. You, you missed your one chance of stopping the spy from escaping. Ah, uh, well. Because, like I said before, this guy is named Admiral for a reason. And he was smart enough to bring back up. Yeah, um, creating a five on one scenario where. Uh, Mindak and his lead warbird can just uh, bail and uh, leave the Enterprise D to fight the other four. <laughs> yeah, trust me. That um, have fun with that one. Thing is, though, that's literally the only thing we actually see uh, Mindak do. Mindak shows up to extract Tapel in feigned negotiations. Me, personally, as a player in a situation like this, I would be like, ah, yes, I see. But, well, we um, still need to finish the negotiations, don't we, Admiral? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, as you uh, mentioned, Seelock will be um, ne negotiating on behalf of the Romulan Empire. We, I, I'm, that is different from what we had planned, but uh, we can work with that, I suppose. Okay, that's what I would do as a player in a scenario like this if I was in Picard's role. <laughs> Why? Because I know it would screw with the Romulans' minds. What they're expecting is for me to go into a, a violent... Uh, is to violently attempt to uh, reclaim uh, a sea lock and, you know, do stuff like that. And it's like, oh, yeah, well... But, you know, what's done is done and can't be undone. What can be done? Hmm. Well. Anyway, though. Seelock actually does get brought up in uh, Lower Decks. Briefly mentioned, but brought up. Do, 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 do. Again, is that... They never actually explain why they decided to extract her as an intelligence asset. Just that they had decided that they were, that they wanted to uh, arrange an extraction. 
Now, if you're going to have to play with this in a TTRPG, that is absolutely something that you should expect the players to ask about. Because, like I said, it's like my logic here is like, oh, well, we are here for diplomatic negotiations. Please let us proceed. Um, yeah. Although, to be quite honest, due to the way that the episode is framed, because of the fact that this is kind of sort of treated as a B plot, and Data isn't personally involved with the majority of the ambassadorial stuff, other members of the crew are handling that. And, but since Data is not personally doing it, and we're looking at everything from Data's perspective, the viewers of the episode don't see the episode from a perspective that lets them understand why they're even doing the diplomatic negotiations. I mean, the only thing we know is, is that it's something, something, um, uh, normalizing relations. That's it. Vague, vague thing of not necessarily even like attempting to try to sign a treaty, just, you know, discussing relations between Vulcans and Romulans and what they're going to do in the future and stuff. And how many years has it been that she has been a member of the Starfleet Diplomatic Corps? When did she get embedded as an intelligence asset? Because this is season four of the Next Generation. Season four of the Next Generation, from an in-universe perspective, is not that much later than the neutral zone, which supposedly is the first time the Federation has had diplomatic contact with the Romulan Star Empire for decades, which, given the longevity of Vulcans and Romulans, and the fact that this is a um, middle-aged or becoming elderly uh, woman, by even Vulcan and Romulan standards, it's possible that she has been an embedded intelligence asset since before the Romulans went into their little isolation thing on the other side of the neutral zone. Which again gives you the question, it's like, why leave now? Maybe it's entirely because of the fact that um, she's no longer passively watching. I don't know. Again, not explained in the episode. You could make up ideas, like, because, like, like, the whole thing of, like, having active negotiations between the Romulans and the Vulcans, you know, might mess up what she was trying to do. So she's going, like, ah, well, scrub this mission. Let's go do something else. We never see the character again. Because, like, you know, Seelock, as someone who is assisting with um, negotiations with the Federation from the Romulan side, um, I can definitely see why the Romulan diplomats would want to um, assess her thoughts on matters. Hmm. Because, you know, someone who was for years a member of the Starfleet Diplomatic Corps learning about them from the inside invaluable information anyway though but yeah we don't really have a whole lot of information there now let's look at the rest of the stuff in the episode oh uh, yeah let's see we have this guy by the name of mbato who shows up at the end of the episode or well gets talked about at the end of the episode as um you know yet another minor uh everyday thing that uh, needs to be um handled uh Oh, yeah. Wait, why was this in the, mentioned in the episode? Uh, oh. Uh, 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 got brought up some at some point. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, oh, one of the things that they did, uh, that data was, uh, uh, observing during this was. Uh, doing a long-range sensor scan of the Mirasaki Quasar because of the fact that it's a quasi-stellar whatever thingy that is dominating this uh, region of space. Sure. 
Eh, divorce. Yeah, we looked at that right. Okay, that was got to go. Well, Basalt. Now, apparently the um, Enterprise actually had two different Bolian bartenders. In later episodes, you have a different Bolian by the name of Mott that often gets confused with Basalt. Or rather, Basalt gets mistakenly uh, believed to be the same character as Mott. As we can see here, Basal does not have any stripes on his head. A bit unusual for Bolians. But, as we see here, Mott it really does not look like the same character at all. Different makeup, different actor. A similar costume, though. Similar enough that you, you have to question, it's like, is this supposed to be a, a bartender or barber uniform or what? I don't know. The Star Trek Encyclopedia thinks that they're supposed to be the same character, even though they don't have the same name, actor, or makeup. Whatever. Anyway, moving along. Martinez. This is someone who's kind of sort of a minor recurring character. Uh, he is one of the people who assists Dr. Crusher with doing medical stuff. And, you know, if you were to go in and, and make up a list of significant minor crew that you show up with in multiple episodes, he's on the list. Because look at this, seriously, this many episodes. And he's one of the characters who shows up in Data's Day as one of the um, uh, char characters who gets talked about. Seriously. In terms of this list, 86 appearances of, of Martinez. Many of which are basically just blink and you'll miss it. Uh, we, we, we needed to have three crewmen up for this particular um background scene so uh, we want you to stand here holding a tricorder a lot of his appearances are on that level but he has 86 of them quite impressive for a uh, a person who's not main cast um yeah and again um like i was saying before he's kind of sort of like there but, you know, from a TTRPG standpoint, this is something that's nice to have. It's like it's a recurring NPC that the players interact with that gives them a sense that of the world around them being, you know, something that's kind of real in a way. Where they, where they have things that they expect to be there and can rely on to be there. Uh, well. And here we have Kellogg, who is... Yet another one of the uh, minor ca characters who shows up in many episodes as well. Only 43, but still, 43 is more than most of the minor characters. And she ended up being in first contact. That's cool. And yeah, again, in Data's Day, she's just one of the many characters that Data talks to about something during the point of the episode. Wait a second, why is it only list a single name here? Oh, her actual name is Roberta Oppenheimer. Okay, she gets credited as Cameron. Just Cameron. Where you can't not really sure if it's supposed to be a first name or a last name. Okay. And she's apparently played more than one character. Hmm. Whatever. Oh, oh, she's one of the, the, the people who uh, there's like a background performer and stunt performer sometimes. Okay, yeah. Hmm, whatever. Anyways, moving on. So yeah, it's like this episode, because of the fact that it's Slice of Life, you have a bunch of NPCs that you normally wouldn't talk to. If you see them at all in the episode, they're basically just like walking around in the background. But this time, you actually talk to them about things. And that's pretty cool. Because of the whole like Slice of Life aspect of things. Hmm. 
the whole thing with the 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 uh, bully and bartender, um, yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, it's just like uh, Crusher, and uh, it basically just like talks to him for a moment, and because it was like talking about dancing, which is that's the fun part about this is that Martinez and Crusher are actually talking about dancing, <laughs> and of course Data ends up talking to Crusher about that as well. Hmm. Anyway, though, yeah. A slice of life episode where you have all of this stuff to be um, there just for um, giving the players things to do. Not necessarily a big picture plot. You're kind of giving them things to do. And they, they may have, and see, because like in here, there is, of course, the idea that the Romulan person who is currently pretending to be a Vulcan ambassador is going to get extracted. But players don't know that, so they're not specifically looking for it. They're just doing stuff. Would players actually have some idea of it? Well, one thing that is noteworthy here is that... Um, it is the end of Act 3 when the extrication happens. And that is uh, when uh, the actual um, mystery goes from, oh, we're just doing slice of life stuff for three acts, to, oh, there's a real problem that we need to deal with. And, you know, oh, yeah, also, here's where Ensign Kellogg pops in. It's, it's like, yeah, just a little bit here, there, wherever. Again, not my character. And of course, uh, section four is Admiral Mendak is angry and furious that the uh, 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 um, Vulcan ambassador is not going to be doing the uh, plan negotiations. Or, yeah, this is one of those things where Picard's like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, right. I don't believe you. <laughs> But Picard's like, well, um, I need the, I, uh, you guys to find information about what actually happened because I don't believe these Romulans are telling the truth. It's like I beamed her to the ship, and then suddenly the transporters fail, and she's supposedly dead. Really, I don't believe that. And of course, it gets revealed that actually, yes, uh, the, it was a thing. But that's the final scene of the episode. Well, okay, not actually the final scene. The resolution of the uh, plot with the ambassador is when Seelock's like, yeah, 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 bye. And uh, Admiral Mindek uh, has his friends uh, decloak and then threatens to blow Picard up if he doesn't go away. And even Riker's like, yep, okay, the Romulans win. Nothing we can do about it. Guess we have to go home now. And then the episode ends with the um, wedding of Keiko and Miles. Which is what I was saying earlier about how the Keiko and Miles story, while from an in-universe perspective, you would expect the um, ambassador story to be more important. Um, the Keiko thing is actually written as the A plot because they're literally introducing a new character that they're planning on having being like, well, okay, Wesley Crusher isn't technically a primary cast member. He would be a secondary cast member, and Keiko also is a secondary cast member. So going forward in the series, Keiko is a character that is approximately as important as Wesley Crusher. Which is the majority of what this episode is for. And you know what? You want to add characters to a TTRPG? Go for it. Make sure the players actually, you know, appreciate the character. And actually, you know, do something with the character. Don't just, like, add someone. I mean, because, like, for example, if I the thing with um, 
those two uh, minor background characters. Like having those around is um, kind of sort of like having carpet. They don't do enough in most episodes for you to actually pay attention to their existence. Like until I looked that up on in the wiki, I didn't know how many episodes either one of those characters had appeared in. I had this incl inkling in my mind that they'd been in more than one episode, but I didn't actually know how many because of the fact that so many of their appearances don't actually refer to the character by name, even that if attempting to memorize it just by watching the TV show, nah, not going to happen. Anyway, though, and from that, again, Slice of Life episode. Having players do Slice of Life episodes so much easier. And while this episode was told from Data's perspective, just having your players wander around doing stuff in a similar tone of uh, uh, random everyday uh, stuff, eh, you know, just give each player their own random daily tasks to perform and uh, have them go at it. And you don't even need to give the players individual tasks. You can have, put them in small groups to do menial tasks while waiting for plot to happen. Yeah. If you want to do that, go for it. Um, there's um, a lot of players would find it boring, but if you're setting up a big story, like the thing with the, with Seelock, that could have been the beginning of an uh, of a uh, story arc involving dealing with Romulan spies. It wasn't because they writers just forgot about it later, but it could have been. This is a good example of the sort of thing you can use as like the starting point of a new campaign or story arc within a campaign. And uh, with that, I will bid you see you later.